start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabby Mayer, and I am a member of Mother Languages. I'm in the German section. I'm also um, part of an initiative which is called the Narrative Initiative that is sponsored by the Center for the Arts and Society, which is also sponsoring John Kenya this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so what we're trying to do, we're trying to investigate um, within that narrative initiative, we're trying to in investigate uh, the notion of wellness and um, how, it is how it's uh, tied to privilege in contemporary society. Um, and so we're very interested in community engagement and that's why we found that John Kenya was a perfect invitee um, for this afternoon because he's very interested in that type of work and he's also done a lot with uh, comic and graphic novels, uh, which he's not gonna present today, but he's gonna talk about that tomorrow in a round table. So I would like to uh, present John Kenya to you, even though most of you uh, already know him. So John is a multidisciplinary artist based in Pittsburgh, who makes art as a way of exploring the natural world and his daily interactions. He received his MFA at um, CMU from the School of Fine Arts in 2008, so he's one of us. <laughs> and he's been teaching classes for his alma mater ever since. In fact, this semester, John is teaching one of his very popular classes on the art of comic making. Um, John has been making comics himself for over 10 years. He draws one panel a day about seemingly insignificant occurrences of that day and has been successfully publishing and selling his impressions in a number of volumes. In addition, John makes sculptures, video works, and public art. A few of his projects include racing with clouds or creating life-size plasterboard balloons that are precariously balanced on two by fours. There is so much more to say about John, for example, that he was a Fulbright Fellow in 2008-2009 in Columbia. Uh, he was an artist in residence for the Tough Art prog Program at the Children's Museum here in Pittsburgh <coughs> in 2012 or he received a creative development grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation in 2014, but I need to stop here because we need to listen to John. So his talk tonight is entitled Larimer Seniors, Community Engaged Art Making Between Larimer Senior Citizen, Citizens and Artist John Pena, and I would like to welcome John, but also all of the senior citizens that are here. Thank you very much, and let's welcome John. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out on this day that was supposed to be rainy but is now quite lovely, a little cold. Shall I turn my mic on? How's everybody yeah. hearing? Yeah, okay, cool. Just making sure, I'm making sure. That's why I wanted to ask, yeah. All right, so we'll get this going here. I turned it to on, is that correct? Did I do it right? Oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, just, I'm gonna put it next to my cell phone now so that it stops working. <laughs> okay, great, so I thought that so cool to have the seniors here. I thought that I would talk a lot about the project that we all collaborated on in Larmer, but in order to do that, I thought first I wanted to show a little bit of a, a little bit of my work that led to that and kind of influenced that in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to walk you through a one old piece and then catch you up with where we are now, basically. Um, and that was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so let me hit the lights here. We decided that this would be pretty solid, right? Yeah, yeah. You're going to drift off in that lovely slumber. All right, so um, as Gabby said, I was a Fulbright Fellow in Colombia in 2008, 2009. And there I was doing a lot of research in informal economies and things happening in my neighborhood in particular as it dealt with the economy. And one of the things I made while I was there were these little dogs out of scrap wood found from the neighborhood. And in the name of the project is Pero Chandoso, which is like street dog. And Chanda is like, in Spanish, it's like saying someone's filthy. So like, esta Chanda. But like, so street dog is like this filthy butt, right, basically. Um, and so I thought it would be a good fit that it was made out of the materials of the neighborhood. And I'm going to walk you through how that came about. So in Central and South America, there's tons of street, street dogs, right? Callejeros or Chandosos, and they're all over the place. And they are so cool to watch because they just are this unit that's alive, right? And they move as groups. And I've seen them shut down entire traffic intersections in really interesting ways. Um, you can also track their, sh you can track the sunlight and the shade from where the dogs are. So as you watch throughout the day, the dogs migrate with the shade, right? To stay cool. Um, and also, there are these guards called Wachiman, Watchmen, Wachiman is how they pronounce it. And uh, they have these little guard areas where they um, 
to kind of police certain neighborhoods, and they started making dog houses for the dogs so they wouldn't get wet in the rain. <laughs> and that was the coolest thing ever. So these little, I'm going to turn this a little bit so I can see better here. There we go. So the Wachi men made a Wachi men dog house, which I thought was incredible. And it showed a particular amount of care for the dogs, considering these dogs don't have any owners at all. It showed a lot of empathy for them. They also named them. This one's Tamale, and that's Costilla. Costilla means rib in Spanish, so it's like saying ribby, right? Because it hasn't been eating very much. Um, and I started asking around and being like, why, who names them? They're like, I don't know, someone names them and it just kind of sticks. So I kept exploring and documenting all these street dogs. And I also noticed something else weird while I was living there that I thought was interesting was that people bought these decorative dog things, uh, statues and put them in their house or around their house. And they were very popular, but all of the decorative dog things were purebred. So like a St. Bernard, a lab, a Husky, but then all the street dogs are mutts, right? And so it was like this really weird thing of like glorifying this beautiful purebred, but then discarding the mutts. And so I thought, okay, this is like slip cast or plastic or injected or whatever. What would a chandoso be made out of? And that's when it dawned on me, it'd be made out of scrap, right? And so I started studying um, the different types of scraps occurring in my neighborhood because the municipal uh, trash was in kind of a crisis at that time because what would happen throughout the day is as the day progressed, people would throw more litter on the sidewalk and I thought it was by accident, but it was actually pretty deliberate. About 3 a.m. every morning, a plastic recycler comes by, a rubber recycler comes by, a metal recycler comes by, and they all make their living by weight. So they pick it all up and they sell it, and that's how they make their living. And then the municipality handles the organic matter, right? And so what happened was the municipality, the city, tried to take over all the recycling, but only paid people hourly. And so it just trash overflowed the city. But when you're working by weight, you have to work a lot harder to make your living. So it was a really kind of dark tale um, about city infrastructure. So I started getting, pick, collecting scrap wood from the neighborhood, and I decided I really like Costilla a lot, so I would pay homage. And I worked with a local carpenter down the street for me, and I didn't have any of my tools, so I just asked if he would help me sculpt this dog, this, chan, this chandoso. And I love the first attempt on the head. It was like this giant head. And I was like, no, we probably got to make it more angular. And then we kind of working back and forth together to make it look how we wanted. And he was saying he put it out front of his shop when he was working. And he was saying oh, he got a lot of foot traffic because people were walking by or driving by. And like, why is there a dog out, wood, made out of wood out front? So they would come in to see what's going on. And that, he really liked that a lot. And I also made it like a, a tool case you could carry around. And so you could disassemble it and then assemble it and then place it in different locations and then leave it there. And then the kids mostly in the neighborhood would move it around. So that's what I thought was the most exciting part um, was seeing where people chose to place it in the neighborhood. Yeah, my only regret that I didn't have more time to make more of them. I only made a handful and this was the only one I got good documentation of. That's one of my favorites right there. <laughs> Okay, great. So now I'll transition, catching up to more where we are now. I have a real interest in um, language and text and physicality of text and how thoughts manifest. This is a mural I made for the Sprout Fund in 2009, located in Lawrenceville. And it's just a giant blue sky painting with these little thought bubbles, like cartoony thought bubbles that turn into clouds. And I like the idea of like using a comic image to turn into something more naturalistic. And more than anything, the, the reason I wanted to do this mural this way was because Pittsburgh winters can be really gray. And so I like the idea that there would just be this spot of blue in this kind of otherwise brick and gray area. And then in 2014, I started investigating word balloons, like the idea of taking a cartoon word balloon and make it into an object. And so I made these like really hard, he heavy, awkward, lumbering things out of plaster. And it says, this one says, sometimes I just don't know how to be in the world. So you would come off the elevator, see it held up barely. Like if you touched it and poked it, it would rock really dangerously. Um, and then you'd see this and then you turn to the left and there was a giant 16 foot one that said, so I talk and I talk and I work to try and fill the emptiness. So kind of playing in a tongue in cheek, jokey way with like existential stuff, but also playfully. Um, and so that was something that got me really excited about exploring this idea of a word balloon. I also made a bike rack for the Cultural Trust that has a word balloon saying, hey. And so I liked the idea of using city infrastructure to create uh, interactive work in the sense that you could pose with it for a photo of you saying, hey. Or you, through the act of using it, are also saying, hey, to someone across the street. So just I like playing with the idea of how one can interact with a, a kind of a functional object. 
And then in my studio, I started making these. Uh, it's actually kind of a funny story. I made a test one of these, a little word balloon for another project that I didn't get funding for. But then I put it on our porch for the longest time on our house. And it was just sitting on the porch. And then I had to take it apart because it was about to fall apart. It was just a little tester. And I took it down. And then one day I was working on the porch. And a guy stopped in the middle. Of the, he was driving. And he just stopped. And he goes, where's the hello? And I was like, oh, uh, I took it down. I have to work on the porch. He's like, well, you better put it back up. That's... He said, like, that's where I told my buddy how to turn right at my house or something like that. So he was using it as a guiding, giving directions to somebody. Um, so I put it back up on our house. I don't have a slide of that, but I put it back on the house and then I posted it on Instagram and then I got requests for how much they cost. So people were like, oh, how much can I buy one? And I was like, oh, crap, I didn't even think of that. Right, I can sell these things. I have to make it, you know. Uh, so that's what I started doing is making these smaller ones that I can ship out and sell. Um, and I've been selling, I started selling last year and uh, they can be mounted pretty easily. Here's a sample of someone who bought one and then posted it, and then I, wanted, I asked if I could use their picture because it was really cool to see where they put it on their house. So the idea, the idea of being able to integrate artworks into one's life in a much more like, yeah, in a subtle way that doesn't have to be like, um, yeah, yeah, there's just like different ways of uh, exploring art in, in people's lives. So that brings us up to working with the senior group. So uh, in 2016, there was a call through the Office of Public Art and Neighborhood Allies looking for artists to partner with, um, artists to partner with community-based organizations to create new works of art that aren't predetermined. The idea would be we would work together, a community-based organization and an artist would work together to create something together. And they would spend the first year just doing research together as opposed to coming up with a, an idea and just doing it which that's what I responded to was that I got to work with a community-based organization and learn slowly and take my time with something. And that's where all this, uh, that's where I was partnered. I interviewed with the Larmer Consensus Group, Donna Jackson, who is probably going to be a little late today, but she'll, she'll come. Um, that's who I interviewed with and we had a good fit. So that's where we started. And we ended up making the Larmer sign, which is out on East Liberty Boulevard and Larmer Ave. And it's basically a little word balloon where I'm asking a question, in this case, can you tell me something about Orphan Street? And then the senior group is answering. Uh, people used to grow grapes on the hillside of Orphan. That's why Negley Run was called Chianti Street, right? So uh, this question and answer. And uh, now I'm going to walk you through how that evolved, basically. That's all of us at one of the uh, celebrations. So it first started out by realizing I don't know anything about Larmer other than what I've read or people I might know who knew, who lived there or something like that. So I thought, well, first, why don't I just start interviewing people? And so I, the Office of Public Art was super supportive and I wanted to pay people who live there for an interview. So I paid people uh, $25 for a half hour interview. And then basically I started interviewing people at the Eco Center and collecting these interviews. And I started noticing something really interesting. All the people I was interviewing multiple times were seniors. So I'd be like, either they want the money or they got a lot to say. <laughs> and I think it was they had a lot to say, excuse me. So Donna was already organizing a monthly senior luncheon at the time, but it was more focused on health and safety for seniors. At, and so I asked if I could kind of piggyback on it and do uh, potentially do some more art, like ways of thinking about an art project together. And she was excited about it. So we went forward and I started hosting these luncheons and we'd get together and talk about ideas, make flyers. Ooh, Tony, there's your garden. There's your garden. <laughs> And then, so that's us getting together. And so the first thing I did was I took the interviews and I took excerpts from them that I thought popped out and we read them out loud in different luncheons and shared ones that we thought were interesting. So for example, I shared the one about the grapes on Hillside and D, one of the seniors was saying this text. So I proposed a really simple direct idea, which is what if we just take that text literally and manifest it physically in the space it's talking about. So this would be where Negley Run would cut down and, um, right at the corner of the bridge. And so I just roughly, roughly photoshopped this sketch, brought it, showed it to the seniors. We talked about what it could look like. And then we needed something to unify it. And people responded well to the word balloon. So we used that both as a way of visually unifying it, but also physically the metal itself needed to be unified together to hold up as an object. So it kind of slowly evolved along these lines. The idea would be that the text could change out every couple of weeks. And so we mocked up different ideas of how that could look. Now here's where it gets really interesting because we hired a uh, standard and custom to help us with material and they're a design build firm here in Pittsburgh. 
and they were pushing pretty. Um, they were pushing for Corton. Does everybody know what Corton is? It's what U.S. Steel's made out of. It's a really popular steel in Pittsburgh, especially. It, it, um, the way that it patinas, the way that it gets uh, rusty and orange, is actually a protective measure that. Uh, it creates to protect itself and stop rusting. So it, it's a very unique to this area or very unique aesthetically to the area. But something about it too is that it represents a nostalgia for steel that I noticed during the senior luncheons nobody cared about. And in fact, D, who's not here, was like, I don't want steel. We're tired of steel. We're done with steel. <laughs> and I, I thought that was interesting because I think younger people might say, oh, steel's so cool because it like harkens back to the industry. But people who live through it are like, no, we're done with steel. We don't want any more steel. Let's, uh, I think I made, oh, sorry. I think I made, oh yeah, there was a slide in there where we were going to potentially go to the um, Cary Furnace site and all the seniors were like, boo, no Cary Furnace. We don't want to go to Cary Furnace. And I thought that was really funny. So instead, a lot of the rapidly developing uh, neighborhood has a lot, this is this part of the new development, which is um, you know fiber cement, angular, uh, pastel colors, brick, and then metal, angular metal. So we decided to kind of crib a little bit off of that aesthetic and use the kind of cleaner metallic looking uh, material because it needed to be, it needed to also last out, outdoors for at least 12 to 18 months and aluminum kind of fit the bill really well for that. So while we were still discussing, I basically worked with Standard and Custom. We made a prototype and brought it to one of the luncheons. And there it was. And we all looked at it. And we tried different fonts. We tried a cursive font. There's Tony trying out the cursive font. But we all booed that one too because it was hard to read. So we ended up going with just a very direct print font. And just noticing a little cool thing standing out as we were exploring it. And that's a couple of us at the luncheon. So then we got back to meet up and discuss the programming. How the text would unfold. How, many, how often we would change it out. All that kind of stuff. And we had to, of course, get a rendering because we needed to get a site permissions through the URA because they hold the lease for the Eco Center site. Yeah, this is where our eyes start rolling in the back of our heads because it's like, oh God, there's so many <laughs> permits. Oh God, is it like, we can't build. Okay, so we weren't able to use a vacant lot because a vacant lot isn't zoned for anything other than a vacant lot. So if you want to do something even drive a stake 24 inches into the ground on a vacant lot, you can't get a permit for it because you need an occupancy permit, right? To prove that there was a, there's a house there or someone's using it. But if you, don't, if you have a vacant lot, it, does, it's, it doesn't have the permit, so you can't even build anything, right? And so there's like these crazy uh, issues that I wasn't even aware of that we opened up this like, um, yeah, we opened up a whole can of worms with this project. <laughs> so I wanted to go through this, I won't go through all the text on here, but I wanted to show basically through this slide that from the time the contract was signed to installing the sign was one year and nine months. Yeah, Mary, it doesn't seem like that, does it? <laughs> but I really want to stress that because there's, there's kind of this idea of like, oh, let's fly by the seat of our pants and do whatever. We'll just kind of do something. And it's like, you could do something, but it'll get vandalized, taken down, and you'll get cited, right? So we had to go through all these different ways to make it so that it could exist in the world in a way that wouldn't just be easily discarded or easily cited, or I'm shocked. I, I, we all thought at first it was getting, the sign that we did was gonna get vandalized. No one has touched the thing. And it's incredible, because like you would think, I don't know, there's, like, there's a turbulent history in the neighborhood, and there's a lot of change happening, and rapid change through like disinvestment of community members, through like there's just been a lot of like really messed up stuff that's happened. So it's cool to see the way that it gelled, and it's really interesting. So then here's the iteration when it was first launched. And at first we just started with introductions to the neighborhood before the conversation started, like a light intro. So in this one we said, on Meadow Street you can find a five foot tall butterfly, a lion, and two pear trees. And that was meant to entice people to wonder where that, where can you find that in Larmer? And of course it's at Betty Lane's African Healing Garden. And then uh, if you see there's the lion here and the butterfly in the back and then the two pear trees right there. So just kind of playing with like a, hey, there's this thing hidden here that you might not know about that's pretty, pretty remarkable. So then we started the conversations. The first one, how long have you lived in Larma? All my life I was born here on Mayflower Street in 1919. That person may or may not be in the audience right now. Mr. Tony, I'm talking about you. <laughs> uh, how old does that make you? I'm 98 years old. I grew up here during the Depression and I was drafted into World War II. Um, any other vivid memories from the Depression? 
Standing in line for stale bread at National Biscuit, at home we dip it in coffee to soften it up. And this, when I saw this one, when we put this one up and I stood back from it, it like blew my mind because I was thinking, okay, that National Biscuit, Nabisco, Bakery Square, Bakery Square. So imagine bakery, imagine standing in Bakery Square waiting in line for stale bread to take home to your family. To, the only way you're going to get it down your stomach is you got to dip it in something wet to <laughs> soften it up enough to eat, right? So it's just like a really profound idea that in this spot is resonating the voice of somebody who lived blocks away from this thing that happened. So I don't know, that's where it started coming alive. And then with this next one too, um, then now it turns over a new, a new senior. I'm asking, how long have you lived in Larmer? 42 years in the same house. Where were you born? Woodbury, Georgia. I lived there with my grandmother who raised me, one of two. Um, my mother lived in Homewood and I visited her during the summer months, two of two. So as you notice that I have to break it up, we had to break it up into um, character length. So it was like fit like 83 characters or something. So when I always joke about how funny it is that it's uh, senior citizens tweeting, but just in physical reality, <laughs> like physically, <laughs> it's like a two week tweet basically, right? You gotta be really confident in what you're saying if you're gonna tweet every two weeks like that. Um, tell me about moving to Larmer. When I came here, I had no job, no education, no husband, no house. I had three babies and a suitcase that wasn't even half full. And then I asked, how did you survive? That was a hard time, but I kept the teachings of my grandma in mind and things started blooming. I applied for welfare and learned that the system would help me get my GED and learn skill. I went to school for typing, the state paid for my bus, childcare, work clothes, and classes. And then finally, I worked as a typist, then got a job at Mellon Bank and was able to buy a house for me and my kids. So that, so that was a bit of a longer one, right? But um, what really stood out to me about this story, aside from it being incredible, um, was this. <laughs> right? <laughs> It unfolded over a series of months, meaning it really dramatically changed depending on the season, right? And also, I didn't even realize this, but if we look at it, yeah, the story, when I came here, it's drab. So I had no job, no education, no husband, no house. And then as the story goes, it gets a little brighter, gets drab again. That was a hard time. Started, and then the word blooming, this senior, she used the word blooming, and it was, you know that it, is a part of her vernacular, a part of her language, and it could not be better fitting for this, because then this is what happens, and then this is what happens. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a really, like you couldn't anticipate those things ahead of time, or it's hard to see those things and you discover them through the process. And then that's us again at another opening. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're up to now as a group, and then end with um, a little side project thing. So we, we started working together in 2017, the Larmer Senior Group. And so um, the Office of Public Art was really excited about the relationship that I formed with the group and the group formed with me. So they asked me if we wanted to continue working together. And I said, yeah, it could be cool. What, what do we want to do though? And the idea was, well, why don't we take a year and do some research? And then we'll take that research and we'll form it into a conceptual proposal that we can then take and uh, apply for grants for more money for a bigger project. So that's the idea, is the next year we're gonna kind of be doing um, research. And the way we're fr framing that research is, we're gonna be taking field trips to different locations. And we already started a bit last year. We started at the Carnegie Museum, and we checked stuff out there. We went to Phipps. I love this because both the Carnegie Museum and Phipps, I think only, um, I think Tony had said that the last time he was at Phipps, it was free, and he just, uh, maybe 1947? Something like that? Yeah, yeah, it was somewhere around there. Um, so funny hearing that and then going and checking it out again. It was a very, it was a really great experience. And we all cram in this bus. It's usually pretty fun, but sometimes the bus doesn't show up. We'll get to that later. <laughs> and then we get together for lunch. And then I've been having visiting artists come in and share some of their work too. We had John, I asked John Rubin to come in. He showed his work, which was awesome because a lot of the seniors have been in Larmer, so they've seen all that stuff, right? They saw the conflict kitchen, they saw the waffle shop, they saw the last billboard with Alicia's piece especially, right? And like all this stuff. And so it was cool to get to meet John and him to get to meet them. And he's gonna give us a tour of the Mattress Factory when we're able to reschedule it again because he has a, a show a piece up right now there. So yeah, we checked out the Hall, uh, hall of Architecture. 
Everybody really loved the gems. We got to go back just for the gems. <laughs> okay, so here's where it gets dire. All right, we're going to do it. <laughs> Notice everybody's sitting down here, right? Of course everyone's sitting down. All right, so I also make drawings, right? All right, so here we go. Uh, so we took the seniors to the Carnegie Museums today, and everything was so fast-paced. I'd asked for a limited distance walking, walking, but I don't think the docents knew that. The seniors still had a good time, but I couldn't, but I could tell it was hard on some of them. And I'm racing, I'm like sprinting to get the locker keys, and I'm like, this is not a world for old people. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do this real quick. I have to see this here so I can see this better. Sorry, I'm just changing something on the screen. There we go. So they, we asked for a limited walking tour. They dropped us off right here. And then we walked all the way along here to go here when we could have driven right here. <laughs> it was brutal. And then I was like, what, what, how do you get, what do I do? Like, do I just like call, I called twice. I like, uh, you know, and then you realize like, oh, right, it's a system. It's, it's a machine. It's moving. Right. So we have to figure out how to navigate that or we need to hold them accountable to be better responsible for helping elderly people navigate that, right? So it got me thinking about a lot of different approaches. I was doing some research. Does anybody know about this? Look at Art Get Paid. It's an incredible project out of Providence where they were basically noticing a huge discrepancy between people who go to that museum, people who can afford to go to that museum, uh, people who have the uh, cultural background necessarily or the socioeconomic background to be able to go to a museum. Like my dad, for example, grew up working in the fields. The only museum he ever went, I flew him to Pittsburgh to come and see a show of mine at a museum. This is like, there was no psychological space in his head for a museum. That's not something that our family did, right? And so they, they were, uh, uh, look at our get paid, they got together and they're like, well, why don't we hire people? Why don't we pay people to evaluate a museum, right? So they pay them 75 bucks, they come in and then they give them a survey and they don't just evaluate the art, they evaluate how the museum treated them, how they navigated it, if they ran into obstacles, how, you know, all these things. And it just got me wondering like, ooh, maybe this is the direction we go as a group. Like maybe we explore how we're treated, how you guys are treated when we go to different places. I don't know. Um, so those are the kind of things we've been talking about. We also visited Ashley Cecil Studio and did a printmaking workshop in Homewood, which is cool because it's right down the street, you know, from Larmer. It was all of us getting together. And they really loved her work too. Um, a little pricey, a little pricey. <laughs> <laughs> she does great work, yeah. Might have been out of our price range though. All right, so future goals, secure funding, which we just did. Woo! Yeah, so we, we got fit funding for 2020 and actually it'll lead into 2021, so that's really good. So we'd like to do six field trips, four local, two regional. We're thinking Cleveland Museum would be really cool because I've heard really good things about that, um, especially as their community engagement program there is super strong. Um, and we're also thinking potentially about falling water, but we got to see how we're feeling about that. Um, and then hire more artists to present their work, share workshops with seniors, and then develop a new product idea. So I'm going to round out this presentation with another project that I'm doing simultaneously. So I do a project where every day I make a drawing and I've been doing it for about 10 years now. And since, ooh, there's a problem with this drive. Scan this drive now and fix it. I'm not going to scan it. Don't tell me what to do. Oh no, it's back. Here, how about I do this? I'll get it. Don't worry, everybody. Don't get up. Okay, so um, I, since I hang out with Tony, we hang out like every week almost now, Tony, right? We hang out pretty frequently. I started making drawings because we're just hanging out all the time. So I was, <laughs> I was conducting another interview with Larmer and checked in to say hi on Tony. He asked if I could take him to Home Depot to get some Portland cement. I ended up going alone and dropping it off. He didn't believe me that I knew how to carry a 94 bag of cement, a 94 pound bag of cement. He was very grateful. And this is Tony's classic accent. Need some help with that? With that? It's very good Pittsburgh, old Pittsburgh accent. I like it. There's a drawing. Uh, this is us at the Mellon Institute. And then uh, Tony told me that the pillars at the Mellon Institute were each quarried from a single piece of limestone. Did, you, did everybody know this? A single piece of limestone? This is bonkers. We went to see them in person on a humid day and Tony was so excited. We then walked to the Carnegie Library and got free ice cream sandwiches that they were giving out to incoming Pitt students. I think we got two, right? We got two. Yeah, it was good. It was great because uh, Tony remembers when they built the Mellon Institute. 
He remembers. He remembers he remembers the train they had to do when they got off the uh, East Liberty train yard and they had to like build a special track and truck for it to take the pillars because they're so long. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Sorry, this coupon is only valid at Penn Hill store. Tony got this Aldi coupon for $5 of groceries back in August. We tried to use it, but they said, see above. Ever since then, he's tried to use it over and over. <laughs> When I picked him up today, I said, okay, you got your bags and your coupon? He smiled and laughed and said, oh, we'll get them to take it this time. <laughs> I still have it where they have never taken it. Uh, there's some raisins in a, uh, they're the same raisins, just in a bag. Are all these shopping trips always begin with raisins? They used to have them in the little cartons and then they switched to bags, but then they switched back to cartons. Uh, then Tony looks for the best bananas while I get honey wheat bread for him. Uh, and then today we got a ton of raisin bran, seven actually. Then get two gallons of whole milk, six packets of cream cheese, one bag of oranges, three coves of garlic, one gallon of distilled vinegar, one packet of sliced cheese and fig bars. In case you're wondering what Tony's diet consists of, uh, a 99-year-old's diet. Um, Tony came with me downtown while I ran some errands. He told me that it's been 14 years since he's been downtown. He kept describing the buildings with names I'd never heard. Later, when I looked them up on the internet, I realized that they were all the original names from the 1930s through the 60s and 70s. So this is funny, too, because for me, it's always been Heinz Hall. But for most of the life of the building, it was Lowell Penn, right? It's only a recent addition that it's Heinz Hall, right? Like the 80s and 90s like revamp of those buildings, right? The Cultural Trust hired me to make drawings about specific buildings via Tony's memories. <laughs> so that Cultural Trust reached out to me and said, oh, we really love your drawings with Tony talking about the cultural district, so will you go downtown and do some drawings of him, and we'll post them on our social media. So we went down, and he told me about the Fulton Theater, uh, which is now called the Biome. Um, while visiting the Benedum Center, Tony told me about the kinds of stage shows they saw there in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Although if you talk to Tony about it, you would never really need to go downtown that often. You had all the theaters in East Liberty you could imagine. Something like 11 theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he would only, only rarely would he go downtown. So he's showing me his really great gravity, uh, gravity fed furnace. Uh, while hanging out with Tony, he showed me his old furnace in his basement. It's a remarkably well cared for gravity fed furnace. He also showed me an old charcoal fueled space heater made of ornate cast iron. So you would put coal in this cast iron space heater and just go in the corner of your room and that's how you'd heat the bedroom. Yeah. Um, I stopped by to go to all, on an Aldi's run with Tony and he showed me around his yard uh, as all the plants are slowly coming to life. This is now the third spring we've spent together and it's so remarkable. Uh, now this will be the fourth spring coming up soon, right? <laughs> Tony can't get used to this century. Uh, we went to the VA in Oakland for Tony's appointment, but there was a mix-up with the paperwork, so we had to fill out a bunch of stuff. A nice man asked Tony all these questions, and he kept saying 19 instead of 20 for the century. Aspetta me, Eddie. It says, wait for me, Eddie. Uh, while going through old photos, we discovered the original telegram Tony's wife, Eddie, sent him from Italy in 1946. It outlined where her ship would arrive in New York, and at the end, it simply said, wait for me, in Italian. His, he met his wife during World War II, and he met her, and he said, um, if I survive this and you survive this, I'm going to send for you, and we get married. And she said, yes. <laughs> and he survived, and she survived. He sent for her, and they were married for 70 years. Now it would be 77. You should draw about all these raising kids. I was telling Tony that I got invited to give a talk about my work with the seniors. <laughs> That's this talk. No. <laughs> that, I wanted, that I wanted to show some of my drawings of us hanging out. He has this collection of raisin, raisin containers from Aldi's that he uses for pens, gum bands, and knickknacks. And so, Tony, I told him about it, just so you know. There's his house on Mayflower Street. He's been uh, sculpting these trees for 60-plus years. He moved there in 1950. Um, and uh, this little tree that looks like a little tree right here is actually a white pine about this big. He, he, he topped it, and he let it grow out. So it's shaped. It moves outward instead. And there's him mowing. And there's Mr. Tony. And that's it, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, let me turn the lights on. I'll turn up the lights. Exit. Whoa. Whoa. I can't. Oh, there we go. Now I have control of the lights. Does anybody have any questions?
da, da. This is I'm gonna I'm gonna go this way because it's blinding me. Hey, just a question. Uh, what do you attribute the lack of vandalizing of your sign to? We should ask them. <laughs> what? Why do you think no one's vandalized the sign? I'll think about it too, but I'm curious. I want to ask them too. Wait, oh, Donna, Donna Jackson. Why do you think no one's vandalized the sign? Because people think it's very interesting with the different sayings. And now that we have not had a sayings, people say, when are you going to change the sign? Oh, because people look forward to seeing the different sayings from the seniors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, content. I was going to say it before. Who would feel fool with that beautiful content from seniors? Sure. Right? Yeah. It's also in a high visibility area, too, right? You have to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a negative space, right? There's a big solid area. Right. There is no big solid area. That's true. It's not like a wall where you might, if you spray paint it, for example, you could cover a lot of ground. Yes. With this, you would have to like, you'd spray paint, but it would go through. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. And what I love about that is even my sister says she, she is not only speaking to you, it's allowing you That right, totally. Just hearing someone's voice. It tells yeah. a story. Yeah, totally. And it does. I love that sign. I really do. I'm glad you came up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. The I, I, only thing I regret is that we didn't get Frank's sayings in there. Next time, Frank. <laughs> yeah? Um, what's the strategy? Will you keep putting the sayings up? That's a great question, Ms. Donna Jackson. Would you like to feel that one? <laughs> yes, I mean, we do because... We've gotten so many people to stop in the office and says, okay, when's the next coming up? So what we say we want to do it between the seniors and the youth. Oh, nice. The yeah, we're thinking of youth to have some nice little say. Oh, try to translate, like try to engage a, a, youth, co a youth collective, because I think that there's a lot of outreach happening with the LCG. And that especially. means, sorry, but that means you've like transferred the ownership of the artist. Yeah, that's what we'd have to talk about that, figure out how that would work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all negotiation, or it's all, mm -hmm. Yeah, figuring out how that would work. Yeah. Hey. I want to know, since you have now so much information about this neighborhood, could you almost make a comic out of it? Like mm -hmm. all of the different like signs that you're putting up now, yeah. I mean, it's only one sign, right? It's being um, uh, altered every couple of months. But I am fascinated with the grapes, for example. So yeah. I don't know how many people know about that. Can you make like a, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like like chronological comic that sort of like spans a hundred years and talks about. Oh this. yeah, that'd be really cool. We were talking about um, we were talking about with the research we're doing when we're going to places and stuff. Um, one of the ideas that I was pitching was, what if we had like little mini resident artists come in and make artwork with different seniors potentially, and then what if we just asked the artists who came if they were all comic artists, then we could tell these stories through different voices and different drawing styles and stuff like that. I think it could be really cool. Yeah, we're definitely in those stages right now where we're just trying to figure that out. Yeah, very. I'd just like to know how many are when, when, when uh, the sign was there, and I was coming from the, I got to go to my and I am on the SX bus, and I was the only one on there. And as he stopped for the red light, he started reading the sign. <laughs> and, that it was my sign. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> he reading, but I couldn't see that well, and he oh, was right. reading. He was standing reading, and the light turned so quick. Yeah, he struck a light. Oh, you know, so they gave me the the, the, the initiative that people do read. And yeah, they yeah. Don't see it. <laughs> they don't see it. I was really worried we were going to get shut down in the early stages because there were so many like honking and cars trying reading and stopping the stoplight and stuff. Because I think people were yeah. when you're at the stoplight, you're just kind of showing that there's something yeah. to look at. You're going to look at it and then you're going to be distracted, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think there were there were no accidents. So I think no. We're okay. no. <laughs> yeah. Another component to this, of course, is that because it's URA owned property, we had to get permission for everything we said, which is another invisible thing. Like this other dark feature at the underbelly of it, right? We were like, we can't be critical of URA, right? Or can we? Like, we were just like trying to skirt that line, so we decided to focus solely. I think a lot of the direct quotes from seniors emerged out of having to navigate the limitations of what could be said or what could not be said, too. 
Because we wanted to say what we, re what we really thought, that might have been a lot more controversial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk more about what these collaborative conversations are like? You kind of said, like, oh, we looked at that font and then we all booed it because it wasn't legible. How yeah. do those conversations work? Because it's a big group of folks. Yeah, a lot of booing, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's really different. It's, I mean, can you, sp I mean, I can speak to that, but I'd like to hear the seniors' thoughts on that too. Like, um, for me, the way I guess I've approached it is bring in stuff, bounce it off of people, hear people's thoughts, and then let the conversation kind of unfold organically. So kind of like take the data in and just move with it together, I guess. But why jokingly say a lot of booing, I think is um, strong opinions, <laughs> right? Like we have a, like, a group with a lot of people with very strong opinions, so trying to uh, form some sort of consensus can be really challenging. Um, yeah, I don't know. We, we argue. <laughs> we, we raise our voices. We're respectful, but we definitely get into it. Yeah. When Alicia was there last time, I, feel, I had to apologize. Like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. She's like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. You're just a radical. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to really sit down and, and reflect on that a little bit more to give you a better answer. I think, yeah, because that's a that's a really good question, and I think I, that's one of the areas that I haven't been as reflective in because I'm in it. I think, whereas like going to a space and having a negative experience forces a reflection to a certain degree, right? Um, because then it sets up like, oh, how do we navigate that space in the future or another space like it? But what you're asking is a very interior question about an interior dynamic. And I think I'd, I'd have to say with a little bit more. Yeah? What I was wondering about is how, so you said that you were initially paying $25 per interview mm -hmm. and you also mentioned the, um, the pay to evaluate the museum experience yeah. art sort of odd uh, experiment. Um, and I was really interested in your thoughts on whether that was just a way for you to get people to talk to you or if it was more of like also symbolically saying that their stories are worthy of or like a resource that you are yeah. getting from that. I think that's ultimately what it was. It was like, I value your time. Yeah. More than, yeah, yeah, it was like the most obvious one is your time, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to carve out 30 minutes, I'm going to pay you for that time. And then the next step is valuing what you have to contribute. Of course, it's all part of it. But I think that more than anything, I just didn't want to be like, hey, share your stuff with me, and like, I'll give you a voucher for something, or I don't know, like whatever. Like, I wanted to have a direct one-to-one -one value with the time you're spending and monetary compensation. So with that, my, my question is, if you were, like, would you recommend that other artists who are trying to go out and do community-based work or trying to hear people's stories to be able to spread those stories that they like, budget to um, preferably be able to pay people for their stories because that never occurred to me before. Yeah, it seems like such a I think it occurred to me, especially because I got lucky enough to partner with Donna and the LCG. So other community projects, like when I showed the dog one in the beginning, the Genoso, that was very much an organic project that arose out of me living a place and getting to know people. But this was interviewing with the LCG, having a community-based organization as a system that's already in place that knows people and knows the community. So I think I would probably never in a million years have met this crew and worked with everybody if I just came in as an individual artist with no affiliation. So it would have made it really difficult for me and seriously, probably, like, um, I probably wouldn't have done it without having a connection that, of someone who has a pulse on things that are happening. So I think that's where I felt that paying made sense within this particular structure. Yeah, so I don't know if I could uh, uh, endorse something unilaterally, more so say like, it's always really nice to be paid for your time, <laughs> right? I wish I could have yeah. paid double or a triple, you know, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. still, do you still do the, like the dog, do you still do the right kind or do you stick with the The text artwork? and stuff? Yeah. I do more text stuff now. I haven't done a dog in a while. I made a cow though. I made a wooden cow. I can show that to you sometime. Oh, okay. yeah, it's too big. I can show you pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, not as much. <laughs> That's a great word. Indulge. I like that. Are you trying to ask me to make you a wooden dog? What? You would Yeah, no, I haven't made a uh, Not as much anymore. But we can talk. Yeah, that would work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
based on what you just asked yeah. about the DP and the, uh, the P was the, it was an extra bonus. Yeah. But for me personally, I think that we have a chance to speak our voice and somebody heard us. Mm -hmm. They read us. I mean, we're all a different generation. Yeah. And this young man here, a hundred years old, yeah. and my neighbor. And, and, and we're all, up, I'm from the South, I'm not from this part of the country. Yeah. And, and, and we all together, and we voice our opinions, and we have said what needs to be said, and we, somebody else, some younger person, right. heard us. Right. They read us. So they heard what was on our mind. And I think he was, for me, he was eager enough to get it out there. Yeah. Because who would you get to sit out to listen to you? Young people do not listen to older generation. They do not. Young people, is that true? <laughs> You're listening. <laughs> We're younger. <laughs> We're younger. <laughs> no, but I, I take your point. Yeah. But, yeah. But I think it, it's just more of a, it was a satisfaction for me to be able to voice my opinion and for it to be heard. Right. Yeah. And I thank you. And God bless you for messing with I thank you for that. I mean, I think though that does touch on something like what you were asking too of like why I probably would have never embarked on this had I not had a liaison like Donna at the LCG, especially, is like um, the idea of like an artist coming into a community they don't know anything about and doing something is so fraught and so problematic and so complicated, right? And so, like, I'm really grateful that. LCG took me in, y'all took me in, uh, OPA was supportive, and they were okay with it taking a year, it was like a year of just doing exactly. interviews, getting to know people, doing luncheons, uh, building relationships with people, um, like you helped me with some stuff, I helped you with some stuff. So like a lot of that I think um, is what was very unique about the program and I'm really grateful for it because I don't, even within that I remember early on, I don't know if I told the seniors this, but I interviewed one person from Larmer uh, who was a recent transplant, maybe 10 years in Larbor, and they said, they were very curt, they were just basically saying like, you got no business here, uh, anything you do here is gonna be horrible, it's just gonna be bad for everybody, you should just leave this alone and not do anything. And I remember like, that's hard to hear when you're <laughs> paying people for interviews and you're just like, oh crap, oh, is that true? Like, am I just gonna like screw everything up? And, and, then I, and then I just kept doing more interviews and meeting more people and then finding this group of people who are very active, like all the seniors, are so active in that neighborhood and have been such an integral part of the transformation of that neighborhood and the health of that neighborhood. So I just felt lucky to be accepted by that group. Um, yeah, to learn more. But yeah, yeah, it's complicated. It's tough stuff, right? You gotta be, um, you gotta be like super aware of your own biases, your own prejudices, your own uh, limitations, uh, boundaries, like all that stuff to be able to go responsibly into something and so that if you screw up, you don't, you're not doing it maliciously, you're doing it, you screwed up, you just genuinely screwed up and you ask for forgiveness, right? Like it's the best you can do, but it's hard, it's hard to let those defenses down. Especially with a group like the longer seniors. Yeah, Donna. <laughs> I forget, what was that saying that the dog said? Well, the dog said, the dog was quiet. The, the other one was the hey, the hey. And, and I'd like to say, that was my reason, because we you know, vetted a lot of different artists and they had ceramics, they had glass, I mean, they just had different things. But that wooden dog spoke to me, you know, to say, you know, hey, and that's where we were, you know, revising a community that has been dormant. So that hey said, we're coming back. You know, and I kept saying, hey, I said, that little dog said, what, hey? <laughs> you know, and that's kind of the reason why I really looked at John, because to me, it also gave the seniors a voice and bringing them out with the different things that they had to say. Because some of that stuff I didn't even know. And that thing, that one thing said, said about Chantilly, I said, where the heck was Chantilly? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And yeah. you know, Tony said, where was that? And I was like, wow, it's unbelievable where it's just wood to know that there was houses and streets. Right, yeah. You know? So they kind of gave you a vision of what Lorma was in the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah, I kind of wonder what were the responses that you guys got? You know, now it seems like everyone loved the sign. Did that do something to the neighborhood? Like, did you appreciate it more? Are there more, now more initiatives? Or did people come up to you and thank you for this project? I'm curious. Did you get any responses no. from people? No? 
I mean, the funny part is I was the one changing out the sign often, not all the time, but often. So I would get a lot of people yelling at me in really good ways, you know? Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, or like, here, I'll put this back up. I don't know what's going on. That's okay. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I'd be up there taking it down. What's coming up next? <laughs> Sorry, that was a little loud. But yeah, just people honking their horns, screaming at me. Yeah, oh, what? Right, right, you know, yeah, or communicate with the seniors. People, like, oh my gosh, he did that, you know, and that they would be excited about the next thing that would come mm -hmm. up. And yeah, I guess I wouldn't be the one to hear it. I only could, the only feedback I would get was while I was sweating out there changing that. <laughs> the this one lady was really funny. She was like, why don't you put something more like quippy up there? Or like, <laughs> like, can't you put something that's like more catchy that, you know, really stands out? And I was like, oh, I guess I could, but I really like this. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But yeah, you're right. That's the, I guess the nature of the project is you wouldn't really, um, yeah, I don't know. How many more people asking you what they can do in a project like that? I don't know. I'm trying to think. I mean, def people are definitely, I mean, there's definitely like con more and continued interest in further iterations of different types of temporary public art and stuff like that, and for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Observation. I think it. Um, I think that I like discovering the emergence of voice through doing, and so I think with the senior, with working with the seniors, the sign. I was the quieter voice. I was the little word balloon asking the question, and that made a lot of sense because, like, the bigger sign is you speaking, saying your stories, and I'm prompting you. So the aesthetic of that is such that. It's a wooden, white painted wooden sign, which is very much my aesthetic and my handwriting. And then the large metal one is the stories from the seniors. But I think in that, in this, in this particular project, in this collaboration, I've definitely felt consciously trying to step back and not, um, yeah, and not try to control necessarily um, the aesthetic as much as allow our conversations to inform the aesthetic and not be just me saying, oh, I want it to look just like this, but rather, this is where I am in this, this is where they are in this, and this is our relationship. Whereas when I'm making comics, I sit down at the end of the day and I make marks on paper, and that's a very one-to-one, -one where the negotiation is between myself and the paper and the pencil, but not an engagement with 15 plus seniors, you know? So I think that in that instance, a personal voice can emerge more immediately through the material, through the relationship, and then in a collaborative, Case, I think it has to emerge um, just as organically, but with more self awareness, maybe. I mean, I could be wrong. It could just be that. <laughs> I think one of the word bubbles has woe in yeah. response to hardships. Yeah. And it really struck me that you, even if I didn't know who you were, I just came upon that. So yeah. There was a piece of you in that woe. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Came through and just, oh, yeah. That's also another thing I'm going to have to sit with. <laughs> There's a lot of really good questions. <laughs> this is how it always goes where I'm like, I didn't think about that. Or I, yeah, well, I don't think about that. That's why I like questions because it's like, I don't think about it through that lens or those terms. So it's cool to then have to reevaluate how I think about it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well played, everyone. Well played. <laughs> those are great questions. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I think we're. Anything burning a hole in your pocket? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, sure. Well, I just want to know um, if the seniors, especially Mr. Tony, have gotten like feedback from people wanting to know more about their stories, like seeing those comics. Oh, I yeah. oh yeah. Mr. Tony. 
they, they, so that's the thing, Tony is not on Instagram, but no, everyone's always asking me to meet Tony and get to know Tony, and we're trying to plan a spring garden tour, so they, people, because I, I post drawings of him, but I also post when we're working in his garden and stuff, and so uh, there is definitely a pretty huge interest uh, for people to come, so I reached out and said, just ballpark, who would be interested in coming for a, in Pittsburgh for a tour? Yeah, exactly, and a bunch, about 30 or 40 people immediately were like, yeah. Okay, great, we'll collect it at the end then. <laughs> yeah, so you, you gotta do that, we gotta do that garden party. Yeah, yeah. It's really fun with Tony especially, he helped me prune our apple tree out front of our house, and he was out there helping, and yeah, thank you Tony, thank you. And uh, he was out there pruning, and I was like down there looking at something, and then I stepped back and I turned to Jess and I said, if someone drove by, this would look like elder abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, cut that, cut that. Tony. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very healthy apple tree now. It was not doing so hot, and he brought it back to life. So yeah, it's good, it's good. Uh, but yeah, I'll get your email, we'll make it happen. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. This is great.